Hello, and welcome to Let's Just Talk. I'm your host, Hami. In recognition of Women's History Month, we are partnering with the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University to host today's conversation. Uh, we are joined by Dr. Perna Singh to discuss the impact of feminist movements in South Asia. Dr. Singh here is a professor of political science and international studies at Brown University. Her research focuses on human flourishing and identity politics. Dr. Singh, welcome to Let's Just Talk. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Hami. Of course. Uh, for the sake of our conversation, let's begin by defining what we mean by feminism in the context of South Asia. Yeah, so it's a good question, and I'll start by saying that I don't entirely feel comfortable offering one definition of feminism, and that's the thing you'll realize with academics, as I'm sure you have already, which is you ask 10 and you'll get 10 variations of a definition. Mm -hmm. But I think um, what's important to emphasize is the way in which feminism, feminist movements, women's agency, women's movements, how, however you might want to call it, mm -hmm. have, um, have manifested themselves in the history of modern South Asia. Right. And most of my remarks will be focused on India, um, unfortunately, because that is the largest country there and the one that I'm most familiar with. Okay. But I do think that they travel to South Asia more broadly. And within that, I think the two kinds of feminism mm -hmm. uh, that have been really important mm -hmm. have been what I might call democratic feminism or rights-based feminism, uh, feminism that has been articulated uh, for essential rights. And mm -hmm. I can talk a little bit more about that, kind of going back to India's anti-colonial freedom movement mm -hmm. against the British. And through India's post-colonial, post-independence trajectory, women have been at the helm of this really the kind of um, the conscience in mm. terms of making sure that certain rights not just women's rights mm. uh, have been essential so i call that like democratic feminism right. um, in terms of like you know essential democratic rights mm -hmm. uh, the right to resist the right to protest the right to citizenship right. most recently and i think another strain um, is this is a strain which I think is equally important and it's interesting because both these feminisms to me respond to what are two key outstanding challenges in the world today which mm -hmm. is democratic backsliding and climate change and so right. the first kind of feminism as I said would be democratic feminism a rights -based and a rights-based feminism a rights preserving a rights fighting a kind of resisting feminism and mm -hmm. the second would be what you might call ecofeminism, okay. um, which has been for the preservation of the planet and of natural resources, in particular uh, forest resources, as well as rivers in the context of South Asia. And so just in terms of, so I'm not, I didn't really offer you a definition, Hami, right. but I think that this democratic feminism and ecofeminism are to me, really interesting ways to think of women's movements and feminism in South Asia. But this is good because it sets the tone for uh, the kind of conversation that we're going to be having. And so eco-feminism is a new term to me. So how does that relate to gender-based rights or equal rights and so on in relations to women's movements in the region? So eco-feminism, um, in some senses, and I said this is this is I think what the interesting thing about women's movements in South Asia is, is that when you think of things like the women's marches, mm -hmm. or you think of the suffragettes movements or movements for voting rights, mm -hmm. you might say those were women mobilizing for equal rights for women, mm -hmm. right? Or what might, and sometimes pejoratively, maybe called women's causes. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, there's been a big movement um, in South Asia about an emphasis on uh, toilets. Mm. for women, uh, for menstrual products and information and education about uh, menstrual hygiene, both for women and for men. So you might think of those as women's movements for women's causes. What right. I want to highlight in the use of the term democratic feminism and ecofeminism is the way in which women have been at the vanguard of movements that have been for the preservation and promotion of democracy for mm. all, Mm -hmm. And for the preservation of the planet, mm -hmm. not just for all humans, but for our, you know, succeeding generations. So not only are they fighting for themselves, but they're fighting for others as well in the process right. of yeah. the movement. Exactly. Okay. And then uh, to switch gears a little bit, uh, can we jump into how feminist movements in South Asia either differ or are similar to one another? Um, because I know in like uh, India, they have the All India Women's Conference. Mm 
-hmm. and they have the Women's Action Forum in Pakistan and the Women's Rehabilitation Center in Sri Lanka. Is there a collaboration across region or are all of these movements or organizations operating separately across the region? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure that I'll be able to do justice to it, but what I can do is provide some historical perspective right. on the fact that, of course, uh, these countries, as you just articulated them, mm -hmm. are relatively recent constructions. Right. I mean, they're very old, but the, in terms of the kind of sovereign boundaries that we associate with those terms. And so I think one way to think about perhaps the history and roots of almost all the movements that you described mm -hmm. is to realize the role that women played in the anti-colonial struggle mm. and in the movement for independence that characterized all the countries mm -hmm. that you just named. Right. Right. So in some senses, India, Pakistan, you know, Sri Lanka, colonial Ceylon, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. they were all governed by the British Empire. Right. They were all central to the British Empire. Right. And the movements, the civil disobedience movements led by the Congress Party, mm -hmm. as well as other important parties, were critical in terms of the participation and leadership of women. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, what you see today mm -hmm. in terms of these different women's organizations and what you named are just like an absolute tiny... Portion of the bigger puzzle. Absolutely. So for, you know, we could name literally hundreds of thousands of women's organizations right. in Pakistan, right. right? In India, in Bangladesh individually. Right. And so I think that even to answer the question of what are the links between them, I mean, I, I w there is a certain solidarity, but I, what I want to point out is that even if we don't see the kinds of institutional links that mm. we might see that, you know, we might, partly because you have to remember that these are very closed borders. Right. Right. So this is a context in which, yes, of course, this is one geographic region. Right. Um, this is, in some senses, a very common kind of cultural space, mm. uh, but these these borders are hard borders. These borders right. are contested borders. These borders are weaponized borders. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, the kinds of potential that we might see for civil society linkages mm -hmm. and conversations and solidarities are possible perhaps now in the virtual sphere, but very unlikely in terms of kind of person to person. Right. Um, and also that there are differences in regime types mm -hmm. uh, across all of these. So I think what I want to do is kind of take it back and to say that, you know, there are a hundreds and thousands of women's movements across each of these different countries. Right. And in some senses, all of them uh, can be traced or can be understood better mm -hmm. in terms of realizing that this is not new. Right. It's Women, something that's been going on for a while. Absolutely. They've been at the forefront of liberation, of fighting for rights, and so on. And so speaking of, because uh, you've brought up uh, anti-colonial movements a couple of times now in the beginning of our conversation, moving to India, uh, R.N. Ravi, the governor of Tamil Nadu, uh, was quoted saying that before the pre-colonial era, um, girls and women in India were almost equal to their counterparts and in terms of education decision making uh, but a Brit but after the british rule the power w the power of women in society diminished and they were neglected because of which now the country and society uh, are suffering in india and so some attribute the current patriarchal society and the construction and the place of women in these uh in south asia to colonialism what is your take on that? I don't have a take on that. I feel as if in some way, I mean, I guess I'm cautious about mm -hmm. any such generalizations. Right. Um, in my own work, I have written a lot, along with my co-authors, mm -hmm. um, on the role that the census, mm -hmm. which was a British intervention, mm -hmm. into Indian society, how the introduction of the census was a really important driver of uh, divisions between mm. Hindus and Muslims. Right. Now that is a claim I make based on coding every census questionnaire 
um, you know, going back to the 1850s mm. for all countries in the world and finding this statistical association mm. between censuses that count ethnic identities such mm. as religion, but not only religion, right. and the incidence of ethnic conflict along that very same cleavage. Mm. Right. And so when I make the claim that I think the British colonial, and it's not a claim that I'm the only one to make. A mm. number of scholars have made this. Right. But I think that when we make such a claim that the, that the British census played a very important role in the crystallization mm. and division between Hindus and Muslims mm. in the post-colonial period, in the colonial period, mm. I say that based on a lot of research and evidence mm. and analysis and interpretation of both primary and secondary data. Mm. So I don't actually know what the evidence is right. in terms of, of what it is. What I can say is that there are certain ways in which I'm sure you could argue that people would say that yes, colonialism was terrible in terms of perhaps further crystallizing patriarchies that might have pre-existed, giving them institutional form. Mm. So that's a generalization is that the British often came in with laws and the heft of a state. Mm -hmm. um, in, and you know, when the state asks you to do something that does have a certain importance in your life, right. in the way that you know, maybe your sister asking you to do the same thing might it's not. not the same, right? It's not the that same. That coercive power is there. The coercive power, um, the kind of everydayness of institutions, and so there is probably a way in which just that institutional structure and what it decided mm. uh, were very important drivers, but. Mm. I, I wouldn't be able to speak authoritatively on exactly yeah. yeah on which direction it was going. Um, you know, there's definitely talk of colonial savior complex, right? Right, and so there was definitely this. They were bringing in ideas of Victorian morality. Right. So certainly, in a state that I've studied in Kerala, in South India, mm. the British uh, British missionaries, to be particular, but not just British missionaries, European missionaries more broadly, Protestant missionaries in particular, mm. were very important in kind of leading these movements that were to change indigenous dress. Mm. So for instance, women in Kerala did not cover their breasts. Right. Um, and so, so there was a lot of kind of shaming mm. and a lot of change um, that was instituted. Mm. So, but you know, is that good? Is that, you know, so I, I feel Those as are a lot of subjective questions that need to, that we need to spend more time evaluating and gathering data for in order to have concrete uh, takes on it. Um, exactly, and not just quantitative data, you know, just even kind of like really wrestling right. with that question. Right. But I think it's a very rich question. Right. I think we're still just about coming to terms with colonial legacies. Exactly. And so maybe you've just kind of opened up a new research agenda, which right. is... Somebody should pay me to do it. Um, <laughs> and so uh, to pivot a little bit, um, what role are feminist movements or women movements are playing in the region in challenging traditional gender roles and promoting gender equality in South Asia, India, or wherever you know of? Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question too. And uh, I think again, what I'll say is that it's not just about gender equality, right. it's about really human rights okay. and equality of all citizens. Right. And that I think is what is, I don't want to say unique to South Asia, mm. but given that I'm here kind of talking about women's movements in South Asia, I feel I do need to make the point. That is a kind of unique context they didn't know. It's an important thing to keep in mind is mm. that women have been making things better and fighting to make things better, not just for themselves, for everyone. And, but really for everybody. And so if you... And so, so how do you convince men in a patriarchal society that my right, I mean, my human rights as a not as a woman, because I don't live in that body, but how do we convince men who may not be necessarily, or just anyone in general, who may not be in line with the fact that having the same human rights as you, or equal rights as you, does not take away from your rights? I'll give you an example of what I mean to kind of make sure that, that I'm kind of being able to communicate this. Right. So in India, within the post-independence period, mm. so India is a democracy, right? right? But for instance, I'll begin in the present period and then take you back a little bit. So India in the last few years has had a precipitous decline, as you probably know, mm -hmm. in our democratic scores. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't need to look at the scores, you just need to read the newspaper or not read the newspaper because the media has been bought by the government. Right. But there's been a massive democratic backsliding and erosion of essential civic rights. Mm -hmm. 
And the most important movement against this democratic backsliding that happened was in the streets of big Indian cities mm -hmm. in the months and weeks just before the COVID pandemic. Mm. So December 2019, January 2020, February, March were tumultuous months for India. Mm. And you might argue counterfactually that if COVID had not broken out, things might be very different in India today, mm. which is that there was a revolution out on the streets. Mm. And this revolution was against, in some ways, this one particular act, but mm. a broader program on the part of the Hindu nationalist government right. uh, to erode the rights of minorities, mm. and in particular, Muslims. Right. And the Citizenship Amendment Act had basically stripped the possibility of Muslim refugees being mm. able to access citizenship in India. Right. And it came quickly on the heels of the National Registry of Citizens, which was also potentially going to disenfranchise Muslims who had lived in India. So mm. not a question about women per se, right. but a question really about the heart and soul of what it means to be Indian, right. which is about living in a democracy and having essential rights India and the U.S. are the world's two biggest democracies. Mm -hmm. And it's something that India has prided itself on, especially when we're talking about South Asia, is that it's had a consistent democratic record. Mm -hmm. Democrat, democracy has, has rarely been in such threat as it has been today. Mm -hmm. There's been a brief period in the 1970s. But the women who came out on the streets to protest mm -hmm. were mothers, daughters, grandmothers. Mm -hmm. right? And I brought this book along just mm -hmm. to kind of give you a sense of it. Um, so full disclosure, I know and I'm related to the photographer, mm -hmm. but it's a book that has kind of gotten a lot of press lately. Right. And it's about the women right. of this neighborhood. I'll give you a sense, you know. These are just like the flags wow. and stuff. That mm -hmm. this is, These are the barricades mm -hmm. that give you a sense of, you know, what it meant to be there, right? and these are the portraits that have been made by the photographer, Prathna Singh. Mm. The book is called Har Sham Shaheen Bagh, okay. which means every evening Shaheen Bagh. Mm. And for anyone who came to this kind of makeshift occupation of mm. a highway in Delhi mm. in the winter, and so you can get a sense of the kind of generational mm. um, you know, yeah. diversity right. of the protesters, and this uh, are the women who were protesting mm -hmm. for basically democrat for democracy in india right. this, i would say that this is one of the biggest democracy preservation movements of and women time. have been at, at the, the helm of it right yes. and so how did men get involved they got involved by coming to this movement right. which was led by women right. fearlessly courageously in one of the bitterest coldest months mm -hmm. on history in delhi mm -hmm. coming out day after day Mm -hmm. and chanting peacefully mm -hmm. and so you know these are the women who are like the guardians in a sense of India's secularism of India's democracy and you know it has resonances with the women who are protesting in Iran right and it has resonances with women coming out to protest Trump mm -hmm. now, these are women who yes the provocation in Iran might be the hijab but it's essential civic rights it's essential democratic rights mm -hmm. and that's what I want to kind of just emphasize is that these women have been fighting not so the men have basically been coming on board and so to while we're in India Modi how has the rise of Modi impacted uh, women's movements because mm -hmm. uh, clearly it's animating people to come out in the streets and to say that enough is enough and then how are Muslim women and other women embracing their identities and embracing their power to stand and say um, we stand for justice we stand for human rights we stand mm -hmm. for democracy yeah no absolutely so I think your question is in some ways absolutely related to what I just right. mentioned which is of course uh, the protests were triggered and, and you know just to be fair mm -hmm. the the women of Shaheen Bagh coming out and occupying the highway was uh, precipitated by police violence against both male and female protesters in a university nearby. Mm. So the, the protests involved, you know, everyone um, across all genders mm. and across really many socioeconomic uh, groups. But I think what you mentioned is a very important point, which is how does ethnicity maybe or religion mm. intersect with right. gender? Right. And if I take that more broadly, um, I think the interesting way to think about it is to return to this point about ecofeminism that mm -hmm. I'd made at the beginning, mm -hmm. which is one of the most important movements has again been for the preservation of water mm -hmm. and for rivers. Mm 
and in many ways against the damming of rivers by large corporations and hydroelectric projects mm -hmm. uh, that submerge land, land that is that has been settled for mm -hmm. centuries and is very important to indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways uh, you see that resistance, the resistance for the protection of the planet. Mm -hmm. Also indigenous women have played a very important role in it. Mm -hmm. And it's also for the preservation of resources uh, that are essential for the planet, essential uh, for certain indigenous groups. And so one of India's big eco-feminist movements, uh, which you might have heard about, was in the 1970s, called mm. the Chipko movement. Right. Chipko means to stick. Mm. And it, so it means also, so the movement was because women came out to hug trees, like literally bodily mm. embrace trees mm. to prevent them from being felled by private contractors, uh, by loggers who had received often corrupt contracts from the state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a this is a kind of long history of an intersection of indigeneity, mm -hmm. of religion, of so kind on. of the protection of the planet and gender. And so you mentioned as you mentioned intersectionality, how has these movements also been addressing uh, things such as the caste system, mm -hmm. um, the differences in class, uh, the differences in religion, ethnicity, sexuality? Um, and so on. Yeah, those are great. Those are great points, and I think you know, you could probably speak for so long on on each of them. You know, so just to touch on LGBTQ plus movements, uh, mm -hmm. again, those have become really important. Uh, the in you know, there was a landmark judgment mm -hmm. by the High Court and then Supreme Court that basically because India I mean so actually this gets back to your point about the colonial legacy right. so one of the things that happened was the continuation in India and South Asia more broadly of a lot of colonial era laws like against the 1533 Berger burglary act I you know I'm so I'm, it's basically an act that was introduced to criminalize non procreative uh, Yes, sex. I think you might be right. For a political scientist, I'm so terrible on numbers and dates, so yeah. I, I trust you on all of that. Okay. Yes. But yeah. No, so anti-sodomy, for instance, yeah. you know, so that just remains on the books. Right. And, but what it does is that it essentially criminalizes gay sex right. and homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And so there have been really important movements led courageously by men, women, people of all genders uh, who have embraced the fight against the kind of repeal of colonial era legacies. So mm -hmm. that is a, a very institutional mm -hmm. legacy that, uh, that movements have had to confront. And in, in the area of religion, mm -hmm. um, Hinduism in the caste system, right. um, and you know, the difference in religion, the tensions between Muslims and Hindus, um, you've touched on it a little bit as like the women in Delhi coming out. Mm -hmm. um, and in the photos that you showed us. Uh, but is there any more things we can learn about how uh, women movements are dismantling these uh, cleavages and these differences in, in South Asian society? Yeah, so I think the first thing I want to just kind of touch upon is a very, very important point that you have made and, and that we haven't taken up so far, which is about caste. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even as we think about India being a very unsafe place for women, mm -hmm. um, being a very violent place for women, mm -hmm. there is absolutely no doubt that the, the, that particular substrata that has been most vulnerable to mm -hmm. violence, to stigmatization, to discrimination has been Dalit women. And I use the word women, you know, I should have said at the beginning, kind of very capaciously um, and, and not just restricted to kind of, you know, uh, cis women. But Dalit women have been the victims. For our audience, can you define what Dalit women are? Oh, yes. A very good point. Thanks, Ami. Yeah. Um, so they are women who belong to castes that were formerly untouchable castes mm -hmm. or beyond the caste system. Mm -hmm. And so the caste system is an ascriptive hierarchy mm -hmm. that ex existed not just in India, but across South Asia for millennia. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, you know, there's so many ways to, to describe it, but the kind of classic, but, you know, very simplistic way is that it's a hierarchy that is an occupational hierarchy. Mm -hmm. 
with the Brahmins at the top, the priestly class, and uh, the artisans and laborers at the bottom, and mm -hmm. then a caste that is almost considered beyond and below the caste system, mm -hmm. which are what used to be the former untouchables. Uh, they were called by Gandhi as Harijan, the mm -hmm. children of God. But the term that is used most commonly, which I used, um, and which is usually the one that's used by Dalit movements, mm -hmm. is Dalit. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, these formerly oppressed, discriminated, and today too. I mean, so formerly uh, caste is illegal, outlawed mm -hmm. in India. Again, talking about the colonial legacy and the dismantling of the colonial legacy, post-independence India very explicitly in the constitution, which was written essentially by one of the greatest Dalit, one of the greatest Indian, Indian intellectuals mm -hmm. who happened to be Dalit, Dr. Ambedkar, mm -hmm. um, outlawed caste. And yet, of course, it's an everyday reality in India. You mm. can't go very far from some. I mean, you can't go anywhere without someone trying to infer or judge or explicitly ask you your caste. Mm. You just have to pick up an Indian newspaper on a weekend and look at the matrimonial ads mm. to see caste. But you don't only have to look there. And so Dalit, so Dalit women's movements mm. um, have been really critical. And a number of movements, uh, Kavar Leheria and a lot of others that have been really explicitly taking up Dalit women's causes mm. are, are also re and really important phenomena. Mm. So I, I do want to kind of stress that. And so I think when I think of, when I think of gender and caste, I think of Dalit women immediately. Right. Um, and I think of the kinds of movements that are happening today that are really amazing and I could you know, talk at length about them. And then as we come to an end, what future direction do you think feminist movements or women movements in South Asia uh, should continue to take to keep promoting gender equality, women's rights, human rights, democratic ideals, and all the stuff that you've mentioned during our conversation. Yeah, thanks, Hami. Um, time has flown, so I don't even realize we're at the end. But uh, it's, I think what I, what I do want to mention is that women's move, just to complicate it a little bit, mm -hmm. is that, you know, so far we've spoken about women's movements in this kind of, you know, highly celebratory right. way but it's not always the case it's not always the case and so in particular what we are seeing right now under Modi and in uh, kind of this new ascendant Hindutva is a lot of the foot soldiers of the Hindutva movement are also women's associations mm. and so women as much as they have been at the at the vanguard in Shaheen Bagh in you know, also in the northeast of India, an amazing woman called Iron Sharmila. She was mm. given the name Iron Sharmila. It's the longest hunger strike. So this is the more part about what lies ahead is, and, and also what has been learned from the past. Mm -hmm. So techniques of civil disobedience, like fasting, mm. have been very critical tools in the kind of repertoire of women's movements uh, mm -hmm. in South Asia. And so Medha Patikar, who was part of the Narmada Bachao Andolan, but also Iron Sharmila, who's been fasting and protesting the atrocities of the Indian state in the northeast of India, they've all used fasts and a lot of other repertoires. So in terms of looking to the future, mm -hmm. I think what's important about South Asia is not just the causes that are taken up, mm -hmm. and I think that the cause of democracy and the cause of the planet mm -hmm. are two important causes that have been taken up in the past and that will, I hope, continue to be taken up. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about what is what is taken up, but how it's taken up. Right. And I think that there, India has a kind of almost unusual, I again don't want to use the word unique, but mm -hmm. important tradition, like in the US of civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. and, and that civil disobedience also of tools like fasting, um, both of these women, Iron Sharmila, Medha Patikar, but many others have almost died fasting. But I want to complicate it and say that, you know, all of this is not just for causes that we can really embrace, but for causes that are also responsible for the backsliding mm. and erosion of democracy and the erosion of rights for all, which is a lot of the Hindu right uh, women's groups. Mm. And I have a new colleague in sociology who is very interested in studying women's movement. She works on gender. Her mm. name is Polomi Roy Chaudhary and she is interested, as are a number of other people, in what does it mean for women's movements to actually champion the causes of conservatism and right-wing. Right. That uh, could be an entire topic in itself. Oh, it is. Yeah.
Dr. Singh, thank you so much for being on Let's Just Talk. Yeah. And we look forward to continuing these conversations. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Charlie.